You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. All right, welcome back, guys. Welcome back to another episode of RX Radio. Uh, Jordan, coming to you from eastern suburbs of Sydney. Uh, I've been hiding out in Bondi Beach. That's what I had before all this stuff went down. I had a close friend of mine say, look, man, this dude's like in the know. Like, go somewhere you want to get stuck. Um, so here I am. Uh, so we're riding out this COVID thing. Um, not so crazy here. I hope you guys are staying safe. Here, just hearing some of like the regulation stuff coming through. Uh, and you know what, this good time for this episode, cause it's, it's always good for a laugh. Uh, having Ryan Fisher, um, as, as a friend that I've met kind of just through the industry in the last couple of years, um, dude just gets it. Um, but before we get into that, uh, Prescript level one, uh, coaching certification course is now live online for sale. Uh, and it's been up for the last couple of weeks. We're going into the last week of registration. Spots are filling up a uh, 16 week curriculum. We go through um, shoulder, hip, and spine, applied biomechanics and anatomy, and then the second half of the course, we get into the training side. Uh, so really good uh, fundamental basis. If you guys are interested, we have a lot of details about the course on the website, pre Um If you guys want the course a description, is going to be in the show notes, and you can link out to that. Uh, a lot of fun teaching, especially now, you know, with a lot of uh, a lot of trainers and coaches on a temporary hiatus from you know the in-person stuff. A lot of guys and girls are taking the time to upskill. Uh, lucky as well to have um, cl- some clinicians in the group as well, physical therapists, chiropractors, some MDs, uh, osteopaths. So a good community developing on the back end, and we're starting to see a lot of interconnectivity between people, just in so many different disciplines and so many different areas. Uh, talked about last week. Uh, it's just some of the coaches getting together and collaborating on things and really raising the bar. Like, look, this is the only way that we can win, right? Like, there's so much inundation of just bad information out there where if we can start to make more advanced concepts, common knowledge, and through the coaches we have, I think we're being able to do that. We're going to stifle out, you know, the low hanging fruit of the industry. We're just raising the standard of what's acceptable to put out as content, what's acceptable to implement with our clients. We work one-on-one. Uh, so prescript level one. A lot of fun for me. It's it's been a saving grace in this time as I can't go in person and teach one on one or one to many in a group setting as often I've been doing the last couple of years. Uh, so being able to stay engaged in that classroom community online has been a hell of a lot of fun. Um, so again, time is running short. We're in the last week of registration with spots filling up really quickly. Um, now on to the episode. Ryan Fish, uh, sorry Ryan Fisher rather is he's he's just he's nuts. Uh, Fish came to came to fame kind of back in the day in the CrossFit world is probably one of the more intense, uh, one of the more intense CrossFitters to ever, you know, don the barbell. So he's on our episode today talking more on the business side. So Fish started up a uh, gym called Chalk and then as well as that an online platform um, for training for gyms uh, and individuals. He does a lot on the nutrition side as well. Dude is shredded to the bone. Like it's, it's, it's actually comical when you see him in person. Like he looks like a fucking Ninja Turtle. Great dude. Great sense of humor. I uh, was lucky enough to have him or have us rather in his, in his place in Newport. Uh, and just, you know, you couldn't, you, you couldn't wish any better for such a good dude. Uh, so if you guys like the episode, share the episode, do that whole Instagram story thing tag fisher in it uh and i'm sure we'll get a kick out of it so you hope you guys enjoy the episode looking to register psl1 online um that's going to be up for sale at the moment so head on over to pre-script.com so um hope you guys enjoy and we'll see you next week let's go with the most offensive dm i've ever had wow let's start with that all right I'm sure you've had a few. My most offensive one, because it scarred me the most, is I had a video of a person like kind of like booty popping. 
And I was like, oh, nice. It was like a good looking butt. And like, I was like, oh, this is like very impressive. And then the person turns around and says, I bleached my butthole for you, Ryan. And it's a guy. So naturally, I had to watch it again. (laughs) <laughs> because I, want, I was like, wait a second, this is a guy, and I wanted to see what a bleach butthole looked like. So I, so I felt super homosexual because I had to, I had to watch it several times, several times to confirm or disconfirm. And then I'm zooming in on what a bleached butthole might look like. Oh man, that might take the cake. And then I had to, you know, obviously Google the process of bleaching a butthole. So then it was an educational experience as well. That was an after dude. I do recall quite well. That's a rabbit hole. That's the old clear the search history. That's an incognito tab, 100%. So I know how to, because I've been catfished so many times now, because typically it'll be like, it's. T- I think it's a guy or a girl or something like trying to get pics from me or like having like this sexual conversation to like see how far they can take it. And then they'll send me photos where I'm like, oh, this chick's hot, you know? So then we go back and forth and I figured out how to find out if you're being catfished. Have you ever looked in your store? Like have you ever gone to post a photo in your story and it's a new photo that you have, but it was from something that happened a few weeks ago, and you have to go way back to right, find it. Right, yeah. It indexes based off of the date that it stamps on the so photo. So when someone sends me a photo. Save it. I save it. Ah. And then I go into my story to post it just to see. Right. And if it's way back, I'm like, I'm getting catfished. Oh, clever. So yeah. So this isn't in real time. Or it's yeah. it's It's, it's happened that's... enough where I have to figure out how. Yikes. That's a weird thing to be born out of necessity. Yeah. I'm getting I'm getting so many bleached male buttholes that I need to figure out a workaround. Like how do I solve this this inevitable issue I keep running into? Yeah. Hey, well that's the thing, like nine, ten years ago, like Tinder was like a like a not okay thing, but now apparently like it's totally socially acceptable. Well, I used to always be like I mean, well you have a relationship now, but when you're working all the time and you're traveling all the time and you're in this career path that we're in it's very hard to like meet people like somebody that you'd want to like date long term right like you meet people and it's like you see them for a week and then you're gone or you're home for a little bit like right now permanently on the road but like for me like I'll be home for a few weeks and then I'm gone for a while and it's like if I meet somebody here it's almost the same as I meet someone somewhere else right yeah I feel like to meet people now the online dating app stuff which used to be super embarrassing is like now super normal yeah, like it, that was really like taboo before. And like that was one thing when I met Kayla was like I met her in person in real life first. But then like, yeah, it was a big part of that afterwards was like the online thing because I was in a different town every six days. I still will never do the online things. I've I've met a couple people online dating. Like in person, like you met them in person, yeah. And every time I meet them in person, it's an insane letdown. Like every single time. I don't want to offend people, but they're always 50 pounds heavier. Not in a good way. Not like, in a I good really way. hope I show up and like someone thinks I'm 50 pounds heavier. I'm I need to meet an that. anorexic person online, and then they'll probably be my ideal body weight. I'm when pulling I titles out of this as we go. And so far, it's bleach buttholes and meeting people with eating disorders. Like if the bio says eating disorder, I'll be like, okay, this could be what she looks like. Right. Is it through Instagram or is it through like actual social Both. media Both. or dating utilities? Okay. Both. Because I feel like Instagram is this weird thing where it's like it's a social stock market and like a following is almost like because currency is trust, right? And like public perceptions of the way like stock markets work around like mass psychology and basically how people trust the ability of a company to deliver a product or service. But it's like followings are much like that, right? Followings are very much like cryptocurrency in a way where it's like, okay, I can see... Like when that per- random like old guy adds you on Facebook and you realize that he only all, the only one of his friends are also like middle-aged guys who are into lifting weights. Like, oh, that's going to be a big no for me, dog. But it's like Instagram, you can cross-verify. Like, oh, he has a picture in real life with this other person who I know to also be real. Where it's like, I've never gone down the Tinder route before. But as I can imagine, Tinder is like maybe a little bit easier to not have that verification. It's like a few pictures and a swipey thing. Tinder is like almost this, like they're almost catfish priority like i mean like they're like for sure catfishing people and like hookers and stuff whoa yeah interesting you gotta pay to play pay to play for there that's it's like living in newport it's like it's the living in newport of dating out for those of you out there who you know may or may not know me i was actually really excited to take jordan and his girlfriend around and kind of show them the area it really is like an amazing area if you guys have never been here like i'm in this i'm sure all of you guys know where la is i'm sure all of you guys know where san diego is so i'm just like smack in the middle and it really is like a kind of an untouched like beautiful area where we have like these, you like to say like the Stepford Wives perfect area. Yeah. It's creepy. Yeah. Cause like I do, I grew up in a place 
I mean, you grew up in Jersey. Like, yeah. Jersey's, like, not the most aesthetically pleasing. The shore is nice. Oh, no. I mean, but you're, like, half central. my graduating class is dead. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, we talked about this in uh, when we were in New York in, in December. It's, like, but I almost, I almost was raised to, like, be skeptical of money. And, like, having friends now and being in the fitness industry and kind of doing more on the business side of things. You're, like, oh, okay, like. These people aren't bad people. Like, it's not their f- – and some of these people, like, it's not their fault they have money. Like, you know, homeboy across the street, like, he he didn't choose this life bit. This life chose him. But, yeah, it's a really weird thing to, like, come to grasp with. Like, oh, like, you walked into a coffee shop. We spent $30 on lattes, and you're wearing an Iron Maiden T-shirt. It's like, these people have never seen a bicep vein before you moved into town. Like, this is the weirdest contrast. Like, what are these ones – like, you could never commit a crime here. I mean, if they, even if you did, they'd be like, hey, like, can you just give that back? Right. But it's like they'd pick you up. The guy with abs stole the watch. It's like, oh, there's knock on Ryan's door real quick because you're the only guy who's under 40 and ha- doesn't have like a 401k. Do you have a 401k? Actually, no. I don't even know what that I is. I have some weird investment things, but. I'm really curious as to what that is. But speaking of, like, I just, a goal for me in life was, you know, if I had ever made money in my life, enough money to like flex on people type of money. I would never change and I would just be the same person and, and be like that, like kind of big kid personality. And I feel like I've done that and I'm really excited about it. Like I, I love living here and being the kid, I guess. Am I a kid? I'm 33. Sort of like around here. I'm a kid. Yeah. I mean, it's a state of mind, I think. But I was like, Hey, I'm going to put this giant net here in my third floor of my house. And you're like, it's weird. Is it weird for you to own a house? Like I, you first came on my radar. Like this is years before I even met you. My business partner and co-host on the podcast, Jordan Junta, who's like, Great CrossFitter. He's transferred over to Olympic weightlifting. He's like down in the 71 kilo class, like just became one of the best weightlifters in the country from doing CrossFit really and like really good at this like skill part of, of CrossFit. Like he went to regionals every year in California, like go down to Encinitas and he, and he would throw down and he told me about this guy who told the judge that, that they were going to fucking kill him. And I was like, I, I need to know more about this. Like, I don't care about the double unders of the Toaster Bar. Who's the Johnny McEnroe that's fucking painting the lines? Who's ta- and that was when he first came out of my radar. How has it been this transition from, like, laying it all out, verbal abuse to, like, oh, I'm, a, I'm a successful homeowner here in Newport. Welcome to Newport Beach. I also run the local travel and tourism section of, like, this is a coffee shop. This is a better coffee shop. Hi, friends. First and foremost, I wish that I had social media I mean, I did have social media at that time, but it wasn't something I focused on. I might post something like once a week or something. And I wish I kind of took advantage of that scenario and like made t-shirts like I'm going to fucking kill you. And like just like capitalize on the fact that like I was a fucking maniac. But in reality, like I was a maniac. Like when I would work out, like I wanted everyone to die, not just the judge. Like I wanted I was like the Mike Tyson of working out. Like, Don't talk to me in the back. Like, I don't care if your mom just died yesterday. I'm not sorry. Like you're going to die today and you're going to fucking meet her tonight. So like, I mean, it was literally like, I wanted to work out to the point where it was like impressive to watch. You're like, this guy is going to die. Like, and I, and I have videos and photos of me completely laid out with IVs in my body and like oxygen tanks. And like, I'll show you one of the photos. And it was, it was an event that I was like, I'm going to get the world record on this. And I don't care if I die doing it. And it was in 2012 and it was in California at, in Pomona Fairgrounds, hot, 110 degrees outside, blacktop ground. And Rich Froning had the world record indoors, fucking AC and everything. And I did this workout and got the world record and just went straight to a stretcher. But I won. And, like, that was who I was. And people got excited to see that person compete. And then there was a point in my life where I didn't like my job and I didn't like what was going on. And I thought that, like, you know, I could quit and go get another job, no problem. And a couple months went by and I couldn't get a job. And, you know, I wound up sleeping on couches and in cars and all of these things and lost everything. And as I was trying to build things back, you know, I wound up being at regionals. And I, I should have went to the CrossFit Games that year because the year before I got fourth, which was only one place off the games. And had I even gotten like 26th, I think, in the deadlift event that I was in, I still would have went to the games. And obviously, I got, like, last. And I was in first place. Like, I was going to destroy that workout. I was the only person at regionals that had a 600-pound deadlift. And it was 315 for 45 reps. And I was just ripping through it. And in that moment, my whole life just, you know, came in just all into one vision in my mind. Three-minute workout. And I was like, you actually need to die. Like, in my mind. And I actually don't even remember saying it. I just see it on the video. Like, when you go to YouTube, you're like, oh, yeah, he's telling him he's going to kill him. And I'm like, (laughs) in my mind, like, when it all happened, I just was like, it just total blackout. I was like, I just don't know what to do right now. You're stealing my life away from me. 
But I look back at it now, that was 2013, it was like seven years ago, I think it was the best thing that ever happened to me because whatever energy I was able to consume in that moment just transferred into everything. Like when I did business, I wanted everyone to die in business. Like when I did open my gym, I wanted every other gym to die. You know what I mean? Like I wanted, I was so passionate about everything. And I think that's what like a lot of people started to follow me. I actually got like all these people who hated me followed me because they hated me and then they're like damn this guy's really fucking cool and if you follow me now i'm probably one of the most grateful people you'll ever meet i'll like cry on videos and shit now like i'm still a maniac in other aspects of my life but i'm still super grateful for what i have and i like to look back and give to the person i was when i was like 24 25 26 because exercise physiology degree in college i got another degree in nutrition i was smart i did a lot of things right i just wanted a career in fitness and everyone told me you better love it because you're never going to make any money and I was like, well, fuck, I do love it. I guess I don't care. But then one day I figured out how to make money doing it. And now it's like, I want everyone to know that you can do what you love and still live in the same house as the doctor and still have that same lifestyle if you want it. And I think that's so cool. You know, like I want to be more than just the athlete. I want to be more than just the business guy. I want to like, I want to be like, I want to be like the cool fitness dude and Gary Vee and, you know, the guy that owns his cool business and all these things because I just think it's rad. Yeah, there's like, there's a weird stigma around money and the fitness industry and basically anything that you can be passionate about to the point of like wanting to like take your own life over it like anyone who's pushed themselves for something it doesn't have to be fitness like willing to like lay out on your shield like one of my favorite athletes is is prefontaine Did, oh, where's the magazine where's the magazine where'd it go i don't know i probably stole it does that pre on it yeah yeah but like what was his quote was my favorite quote of all time from an athlete like my favorite athletes are in mean, sports that i don't play Look at me. I'm, I, I stopped running when people stopped chasing me. But when, when I heard, when my college roommate told me about this guy. Did we talk about this? I don't know. Did we? Steve Prefontaine is my all-time favorite athlete. We did, I don't think we did. So when I say, like, where is it? I'm looking around. I, I bought the – I have the 1970 Sports Illustrated magazine with Prefontaine on the cover. Really? Swear to God, I have it. It's It's got to be in that cabinet. Yeah. Like, his quote was, you know, and this mid-distance runners as you – get to work with athletes you realize that they're sadistic fox but like his quote of best pace is a suicide pace and today's feels like a good day to die it's like or someone may beat me but they have to bleed to do it right like that's you, we're talking about running on a track but yeah. to him it was more than that like if we're talking about a 315 deadlift for 45 reps but it's like i think if you can because most people don't have that like i think as you go through and you meet a lot of people who like we talked about this earlier like how many people message you and like want the life you have that's like well do you really want it though and not like for a point of like questioning their their dedication but it's like questioning the amount of passion they have for it. like are you willing to sleep on the couch are you willing to take that to the hospital like are you willing to tear shit off the bone and it's like most people are like no you go you do that and i'll sit here and you just post about it and yeah. I'll, just, I'll, I'll watch from afar but i think what really deters a lot of people is they're like okay for me to get to that level, I have to be the best athlete in the world. I have to be the best chiropractor in the world. I have to be the best physical therapist in the world. I have to be the best teacher in the world. I didn't win the CrossFit Games, right? Like, I didn't become the best athlete in the world, you know? I mean, I did very, very well. And now, like, financially, I probably do better than some of the best athletes in the world. But, like, it's more of your story and how you get there and the why behind it and the energy that you put out into the world and stuff like that. Like just because I was willing to die in that workout or a workout or I was willing to die for anything I ever did doesn't mean I necessarily had to be the best person in the world to have that mentality. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I can't be successful in my own business like with that mentality. So I think a lot of people are like, well, I can't do it because I'm not at that level. It's like, no, like you can win like in other areas of your life. You know what I mean? Like I'm always so surprised that I was able to build what I built without being the best athlete in the world. You know what I mean? Well, like I look at it, this is like a weird parallel to draw. Like have you ever watched an animated movie and the animated movie is like too close to real life? Like I think a Polar Express is like a really strange movie because it's like, okay, that's kind of Tom Hanks, but it's not Tom Hanks. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, there's like a, there's a, there's a phenomenon around that. Like, and in like, like me and Laura were talking about this like a few weeks ago, like, about when animations are too close, there, it's there's a statistical windy. What what what's it called? The Valley of oh, who was it talking? Was it you? There's there's like a, a term to it where it's like there's a point of like how realistic an animation is, and it's unlikable anymore, right? Like if it's too realistic within a certain percentage of how you can quantify facial features and things like that, it's actually off-putting to the viewer. Where it's like that's why Homer Simpson has a yellow face and Marge has tall blue hair. It's like walk around Newport like the, no one has that they're so unlike us that they're likable and I think when people start to be too superlative like it can be hard as like 
the top in the world, I think, to be accessible to the to the, like the realistic people, to an audience or to a, like a customer base, right? Where it's like most people can then just share in the experience of trying to just be better than yourself, kind of this noble pursuit where it's like, I think LeBron James would have a hard time really selling or Michael Phelps would have a hard time really selling or Usain Bolt would have a hard time really selling running camps and running programs because it's like unless that comes with leg extenders and hand paddles it's like i'm not fucking running or swimming anywhere like you right so i think it's something about like and it's a sense of attainability we're like yeah like this dude came from jersey like it's not like he grew up in newport now he lives in newport like i think the scarcity that leads people to think like from more of a socioeconomic standpoint that you can't move up the ladder is like no nah, it's probably more accessible now than ever that relatability is massive. And I brought, I brought, I kind of like drifted into that because I know that you wanted to eventually talk about kind of business stuff. So we talked about bleach buttholes and it's full circle, man. We got to, we got to pull you guys in somehow. The first couple of minutes has to be, I think that's, those are all really good points. And I think that a lot of it's, it's good to make that point because I think a lot of people are always, they feel like they're at a disadvantage when they're actually at an advantage. Like your disadvantage of life is your biggest advantage in business. Have you ever read the, uh, the David and Goliath book by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, I have not, but I know all of Malcolm Gladwell's books are insane. Yeah, it's just perspective, right? Like that's that's where a lot of people just have that that negative frame shift that just sets them. Like he tells the story, and, and I really like the imagery of like the shepherd, right? Like especially in the fitness industry, like this wolf, and, oh, your sheep, and every Monday there's like a guy posts a video of like a lion killing something. It's like that's like kind of this hierarchy mentality that people have. But like the people who do really well in the fitness industry from a business perspective, I see them more as like shepherds right like and the story of david and goliath tells the story of david the shepherd killing goliath and that he's not small to a disadvantage and goliath is not big to an advantage goliath has acromegaly as gigantism like he has an issue with his posterior pituitary he can't see well because giants can't see well like andre the giant rest his soul was not nearly it wasn't really at an advantage being that large as a human being Right, and it's, he tells the story of the shepherd David. He's like, "Look, shepherds were bad motherfuckers, man. Like he had to lead his sheep and kill anything that got in its path, right? and that's what people do. Like I think that's what successful people in the fitness industry do. They don't have this wolf mentality, and they go after sheep. They herd and they sort of lead their people. And the only way to do that is if you can identify, like, look, here's here's a path that I've walked, and I can bring you with me. And it's the people who, you know, like, what path did Michael Phelps have to walk? He has a wingspan of 737. It's like, you can't teach me how to swim. You know, like this, this thing's like. And his feet, like he has so many weird characteristics. Yeah. It's like if you went into a lab, right? But like the likability of being attainable can reach way more people and have greater like impact on people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have, I told you that, that my newest thing is like a social media company where I run other people's ads and kind of promote their businesses and you know, I basically what I did to myself, I'm just kind of like doing to other people and promoting their brands. And I have these people who have like millions of followers. And then I have people who have like 50,000, 100,000 and they make more money than the people with millions. And it's like the people with millions are getting 50,000 likes on a photo or like all these different things. And a lot of people see that as like completely unattainable. And maybe it is, but it's not financially like crushing. Wait, you didn't pay for this with likes? You, you didn't show up with a duffel bag full of likes? It's like, yeah, this Newport looks good. Yeah, I got uh, I got 50,000 subs on YouTube. What will that get me? <laughs> yeah, you tell the real estate agent. Yeah, I have 100,000 likes. Is that? Is... Can we broker a deal here? Some sort of brand partnership thing? I'll tag you. I promise I'll tag you four stories a month. How many shit contracts have you seen where it's like, oh, this is revenue. This is This is social capital now. Did you struggle coming out of the athletic? space and being someone like to go from like i want to die for this workout to i want to kill people in business was that a struggle like in a transitional sense i would say i probably would cry myself to sleep like once a week for like three months and then i was like okay it's fine i'm gonna make this work i'm gonna love it as much as i love killing myself in the gym because eventually what happened to me was well one i was never going to do well in the sport because of that scenario like they would always judge me poorly oh, wait wait because you told someone that you're gonna fucking kill them well dude i remember there wasn't there's was another i think the regionals the, the following year oh you know what i got banned for a year <laughs> two years later for those of you who don't know i got banned the next year because i was at another competition and the drug tester came to my gym and he's like hey i'm at your gym can you come here and i was like no i'm like three miles down the road at this this giant parking lot working out at this competition called the oc throwdown you guys you're more than welcome to come here and test me and he's like oh, i'll come tomorrow 
And I'm like, all right, cool. So the next day he comes, he texts me. He's like, I'm at your gym again. I was like, no, motherfucker, I'm at the gym. I'm at the event. And then he goes, I'm no longer able to meet you today. Or I get this failed drug test all posted everywhere on CrossFit. And in reality, it wasn't, a, it was, it was, I didn't fail. I just didn't, it wasn't there. And then I took the, the series of text messages. I even left the text number of the guy, everything, posted it all over social media and paid for ads to promote it. And I was like, fuck these people, you know? And then CrossFit got really, really mad at me, but whatever. I just wanted to prove my innocence that that didn't happen at all. And I mean, I think what's funny is a lot of people like to accuse me of drugs because the way that I look at my shirt off, but like because of the incident and I competed for another maybe four years after that, I mean, I was like the most drug, I was the most drug tested person in the entire sport. Like I couldn't take a drug. I couldn't even take an overdose of Tylenol like without them fucking probably rear ending me. So like, I, did, I mean, I never did anything. But during that time, you know, I would go to a competition and instead of one judge, I would have like three. And then like, I remember being at a regional event where one of the judges for like Josh Bridges or one of the other big athletes stopped judging him and came over to judge me as like an extra person. And I was like, well, was he counting his own reps right now? Like, what the fuck is happening? Seriously? (laughs) I was like, what is going on? Like, they really want, what's there to judge? They wanted me to freak out again, I think, you know? So whatever, like. I started to feel that I wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to be fair. And then during that time, I just loved training. I didn't give a fuck. So I was still trying to hit bigger lifts. I was still trying to do more muscle ups, still just trying to be, you know, a badass crosser. That's what I love to do. But my left knee started to like deteriorate more and more and more and more. So I have no meniscus, no cartilage in my left knee. And I competed on that for probably like three years in just ungodly amount of pain. Like, I don't think people understand how much pain I was in my last three years. And then one day I, I have a video of me snatching like 295 and I'm totally crooked. I actually have it on my phone. I didn't feel crooked, but I watched the video and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm going to snap my hip or like something else. So I'm, I'm done. Like the video itself that I watched is the reason why I retired. Really? Yeah. So like I literally went from that video to like within five minutes, I was like, I'm done. We're done here. And then I was like, I'm done. And I told everyone in the gym, like, I'm done. It was like right before the open. And everyone's like, you're going to do the open? Like, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go watch you. And I was like, no, I'm done. And they're like, this doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm done. And I would show people the video. And they're like, okay. And then yeah, it was when I got like really upset and like, you know, depressed for like three months. And then I was like, all right, well, I have this really cool gym. And a lot of people love it. I'm just going to start promoting what we do in the gym. And I started, like, I had already had the chalk online programming, which was for those of you who don't know, it's like basically it's what we do in the gym. But, you know, my first year open as a gym, I did something that like no other gyms had ever done. Like my my first year open, I had over 300 members. My first day open, I had over 100. And for a CrossFit gym, like most people wanted to get 100 after a year. And it was basically because of the style of working out that I promoted. And it's kind of the style of working out that I still promote is I kind of I mix in like bodybuilding with aggressive conditioning. And I mix in these old articles from like Pat O'Shea from the 1970s, which is old school interval weightlifting. And for those of you who have ever seen the movie 300, like when those athletes came onto the men's fitness magazine, men's health magazine, everybody was like, what the fuck did these guys do? Like the entire movie is ripped. The fucking guy with the cameras ripped. Like everybody is ripped. The kid's seven months old and he's shredded. Like it was the most groundbreaking film of all time for people who were ripped. And the trainer was a guy named Mark Twight who owned something called Jim Jones, which is a huge Yeah, yeah, 100%. Is, yeah. yeah, of course. So I start looking into this, and, you know, I, I just want to be part of this whole Jim Jones thing. And I live in Utah at the time. I was going to the uh, University of Utah, and I was actually training on the Olympic team for bobsled skeleton. And during that time, that was when I found out what interval weight training was, because that was his big premise. And then he had this huge kind of, like, head, you know, kind of knocking ideologies in the, in the fitness realm with Greg Glassman, and they kind of broke apart. He started his own seminars. Greg started CrossFit Level 1s, and all this thing happened. And I think it's a lot of, it's funny that a lot of people don't realize that all of this came from old school interval weight training from Pat O'Shea. And if you look at it, it produced some of the best results like anyone's ever seen in studies in, as far as like building muscle and burning fat. And theoretically, like, and sort of at, kind of at the same time-ish, depending on what your training volume is at the time and your training experience and everything. But these guys were doing like five power cleans into a two minute row and like just hitting as many meters or calories as you can in that two minute row. And then they'd have like a two minute rest and repeat for like three or four rounds. And then they would do like other pieces like that. And it's like, wow, that makes sense. They did five reps controlled with like, you know, thinking about the rep. And then what really mattered was the conditioning immediately after. So like, yeah, I mean, think about how much better cross hitters would be if they did five reps, not for time, and then went straight into that nasty row piece. You're still building your conditioning and you're still building strength, but in like a 
responsible manner. Yeah. Like for me, the medium is the message. Why are we doing conditioning work with barbells? Yeah. That's a medium of strength. So Greg knew this and he was like, all right, cool. Like this is dope. And I'm going to have my athletes do it. And he did. And his athletes were getting a lot of results, but he wanted to make more money. He was a trainer. So he wanted to get people in shorter windows. So he started doing 30 minute training sessions instead of an hour. And he would just make it faster. Right. And then faster. And then eventually he was, you know, he had like, you know, 15, 20 clients a day and he was making the same amount of money, but doing 30 to 20. I mean, I think he, he wound up going down to like 20 minute sessions and then CrossFit was kind of born. So, I mean, it's not that it didn't work. I mean, fuck, I looked like a fucking savage while I was doing CrossFit. And I don't think I looked almost any different than when I did body when I'm, I'm now I'm doing kind of bodybuilding. Maybe don't, don't judge me right now, right now on the, on the video, because I just had bicep surgery, but yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. So I, I love all the, the old school geeky stuff. And I feel like for you to be good in what you do, you better know some shit. So I put that into my programming and people did it and they loved it. And they just straight out of word of mouth, that thing just blew up. And then, it, but it blew up to the point where like it was making two, three times more than like my gym would make. And then when I decided to retire and be done, I was like, I'm going to put a lot of time into just marketing this. Not like in your face marketing, but just like, hey, like this is like what I did today. And this is like where I got the program from. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, people really are responding. Like this is cool. And then my knee kind of got even worse. So I kind of drifting a little bit more away from like lifting, like uh, like Olympic lifting. So I started adding in like more like dumbbell bench press and more like I started doing, like I can't go below parallel. So I started adding in like more lunges and hip thrusts and stuff like that. And just traditional like different styles of deadlifting and then almost like a conjugate slash IWT version of stuff together. And I was like, what's the most Googled term right now? Like what are people looking for the most in their training? And I found out on Google, it was hit training, high intensity interval training. And I was like, all right, well, that sounds kind of feminine and I'm going to change it to a manly term and I'm going to call it HIB, high intensity interval bodybuilding. And I'm going to get all the dudes blew up. So I started making these high intensity interval bodybuilding books that were tailored to people who like to CrossFit also want to look good. Twisted Steel, Sex Appeal, right? So I'm like, <laughs> that could be the name of the episode too. Oops. That was when I started doing books. And then it was really, really funny for those of you who are entrepreneurish and you want to learn some stuff from this episode is I started making these eBooks. I paid a friend to turn them into eBooks for me for like two or $300. And I put them, actually, I didn't put them anywhere yet. I, I had them just like as a PDF on my desktop and people would message me because I put in my story or I would make a post and I'd say, if you guys want this new book that I made, just to go ahead and DM me. And it would go from a DM to an email to me telling them my PayPal or my Venmo to them confirming that they sent it to me and then me sending them a book for $30. When this first happened, I would be on my phone for 12 hours a day just doing like boom, 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 boom. I might make a thousand bucks like in a day or like a couple thousand dollars a month doing this, which was amazing to me because I was only making a couple grand from my gym every month anyway. So I was excited, but after a while, I started getting burned out. And then a friend was like, you know, you can put these on a website where they just pay and then it just gives them the file. I was like, no way. So if you guys, if you guys want to like really feel the grind and understand the grind, like it was just because I just, I just didn't know, you know, like I was, I mean, I remember like when, you know, the president got elected. I remember when like ISIS was a thing, all these things and people were like, oh my God, in the news. And I was like, what happened? Like, I didn't, I didn't know who the president was. I didn't know like that there was like, terrorist organizations like I literally all I knew was that I had a class at 5 a.m. and my last one was at 7 15 and I would get to go to bed at 10 that's the only thing that I knew and I knew that rotisserie chickens were the easiest way for me to eat right I mean that was like all I knew yeah these things started to happen and then eventually through through time I just like I couldn't tell people about nutrition I couldn't tell people how to go out to eat so I started making like voice memos and sending them to people in the gym like an hour-long spiel on nutrition because, hey, I have 10 minutes between classes. I'm coaching all the classes. I don't have time to talk to you. So I sent it to everybody in the gym. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey, you should do a podcast. And I was like, okay. So then I did a podcast and kind of did this and like would talk about things that I thought were important. I didn't really want to make a, like 100 podcasts. I wanted to make like five and be done. I actually remember getting to the point where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I hate the podcast. People just love it. But what would happen is I would meet people that would change my life. So I would meet people that would tell me how to market. I would meet people who tell me how to put a book on Shopify. I would meet people who would tell me all these things. And I'm like, wow, I'm not really making any money from the podcast, but I'm making money in my network. Like I'm building a network of people who are telling me all the things that I didn't go to school for. 
like I can tell you about, you know, what's going to happen when you lift and what, you know, macros you should be eating for the day to get to a certain thing. But like, if you went to business school, maybe you can tell me how to make an LLC and let's, let's learn about that. I think the biggest takeaway from that is like, I, when you use like the E word, like the entrepreneur word in the fitness space is like, you have multiple businesses, you have a gym, you have an online business, you have a marketing business you're starting up. Like that's an entrepreneur. Like an entrepreneur is multiple ventures that you're starting from a grassroots movement. A lot of people like they want to call themselves entrepreneurs. They want to go down this fucking Uber driver motivation, Gary V rabbit hole of like self help. I love an Uber driver with a dream. This I don't want to hate on you Uber drivers. I mean, I'm sure yeah, that some I, of you guys might actually wind up becoming fucking the next Lyft owner, but like it's just funny to me. People are going to hear this who identify as entrepreneurs in the fitness industry and they're just going to hear, oh, wait, Shopify automation. It's like, no, 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 you can't hear that. You have to hear the manual entry and DMing back and forth. Like when we went, we did a we did a lead generation campaign last November and this is still too, like this is really recent. Like my hands are still sore. And I manually entered the first, last, and email, first name, last name, and email address of 3,000 people in the month of November. I had hour blocks set off. I remember being in a seminar. I was teaching at a at a symposium in Toronto, and I was almost late to the podium because I was on my computer in my hotel room, manually. And John Smith at John Smith at Yahoo dot com, enter next. Jane Smith at Jane Smith at Yahoo, and I did that three thousand times in the month of November. Now we're automated; and it's all sweet, but it's like. Most people, like, they don't run into hurdles until their business is scaled to a point, and they don't – it's not that they don't have, the, like, the, the, the capacity or the, the knowledge base to do it. They just don't have the fortitude. Like, they don't have the balls because in the early stages, they didn't run into these things. Like, when I hear people, like, oh, a lot of my friends now in my circle are people who run businesses in, in the fitness industry. It's like, they've never had to succumb to those inefficiencies – so they run into like a first sign of trouble and they're just out where it's like you're sitting there DMing. It's like, dude, you could have made shoes in Nicaragua for that much for 12 hours a day and made the same money. It's like, but here you are like a year and a half later and we're talking about the architectural design of putting a net in your fucking house in Newport. Like that's dope. I just think it's, it's so many people like it's the same guy that will take a barbell to the grave on a set of 45 reps that'll sit there, bleed his thumbs on the DMs to make 30 bucks on an ebook. Like, you sound retarded when you yeah. say that. But yeah. at the same point, it's like, who's who's retarded? But it's really, I mean, yeah, it, it actually was super retarded. Like, the fact that I didn't know that was, was, like, unreal. But in reality, it was like, that was the energy that I put into everything, right? Like, I wanted to win so like i didn't care i knew that i would eventually win by just emailing everybody and making sure that they were happy and all this stuff and dude i mean a lot of people like me to the point where it's like they just like my personality they just like you know whatever it is about me and my two hundred thousand followers feels like 20 million you know like i have a really good rapport with everybody that i that i'm friends with and everybody who sees me on my store like every like everybody that i talk to like oh i love watching your stories i love like big fan yeah, there's like so many things that they really, really like. And I just feel like it all comes from all the energy that you put into all of your things. Like I answer every fucking DM all the time. Wow. I do the same thing. I allocate time on flights and toilets. Voice? Come on. See, isn't that a little, isn't that a little intimate? Like they, but they love it, dude. Imagine someone who loves Jordan and you fucking voice them back. Are you kidding? They lose their fucking mind. I guess. Yeah. I've never thought of that. And that must be more efficient. Because I have sausage thumb. A lot of times they get they write back and they're like, dude, I cannot believe this personal touch. Like they lose it. And I'm going to edit this out of the podcast and start doing voice memos like it was my idea. Well, I also do – so for certain people, I'll video them back. And like, I mean, usually attractive women. I was going to say, what is this, some premium Snapchat service we're talking about here? But instead of just a voice, like if I'm like if I'm in the scenario where like it's it's like it's a like I'm walking on the beach or something like that, I'll just I just think it's rad and I'll just be like, all right, yeah. So like if you you know do this and that with your carbs and blah blah blah, or if like you know you're trying to gain weight and you work out seven days a week, you should probably have some rest days. And I'll sit there with the with the video and they're like, oh my god. But think about how long it would take you to write it, and and then you're out of touch with life. Like as you're writing, you're fucking internally rotated. Your neck is down. Like. You're just, you're not paying attention to what's happening. I can do the video or the voice and walk and like experience my life and be fine. And I can just get so much more done. I actually prefer when people voice me back too, because I can do stuff and just listen to it. Yeah. And it's like, it's just the way to go. Now from like an efficiency standpoint, like what bottlenecks are you running into? And this is purely for my own 
my own selfish endeavors. Like it, where your business is at right now, where are your inefficiencies from a time standpoint, what systems you have in place, what is something that you are actively working on improving because you have so much input and intake on a day-to-day. There's so much coming in question-wise and DMs and all that. And like, I can't outsource my DMs. That would be that would never be something that I'd want to do because I need to talk to these people. And a lot of times they want to eventually buy a product or something. So yeah, and I'm voicing them. So like, you know what I mean? And then, but there's also, you know, I have these challenges. I have these books. I have all these different things. And we're getting hundreds of emails a day. Like it's nuts. So like, I have people answering emails and it's making sure that, you know, they're getting all answered in a day. They're getting all answered the way they need to. And a lot of times they're not like the people who help me with the emails, they can't answer it. So they'll flag them. And by the time I'm doing DMS, by the time that I've trained, like I want to train, I want to look good. Fuck. I'm selling programs. And then, you know, get to those emails. I mean, God forbid, should I work on something new? Right? Like I have to have the time. Remember like when you were talking about making a curriculum, I was like, fuck, who has time for that? And then, like, as soon as I get a little bit of time, all of a sudden, Sonny Webster shows up. Or, like, it's not a bad thing. I'm, like, excited. But, like, I'm, like, I have to show them around town. They have to see everything. But in a weird way, like, does your mind shift that that's also work? Oh, no. It's totally work. I think people don't understand that. I don't think I've had a day off in seven years. Like, a legit where I was, like, oh, I don't have to look at my phone. Like, all I've wanted to do for a lot of people follow me. I do a lot of adventure stuff. I travel around. I hike every mountain. I fucking ice climb something. I don't know. Anything that you can potentially die doing i'm pretty into i wanted to climb mount kilimanjaro but you have to be away from your phone for a week i literally cannot do it it's not a possibility it's something that i literally am like okay that's that's over here for when i'm 50 or something and i don't think people understand that that that's a sacrifice like a lot of people are not willing to sacrifice a lot of things like in the beginning you have to sacrifice all of your time all of it and i feel like young kids nowadays these millennial type of people and maybe i'm in this category in some shape or form they just fuck man like i literally just talked at a school at a high school like two weeks ago actually it was during wadapalooza i was actually on a big screen because i couldn't make it in person i was supposed to be there in person and then i flew out to wadapalooza and they they gave me a I, I did a facetime and i was talking to this whole high school class i'm talking about what i do and like i mean it was career day i'm talking about like social media and building your brand in the fitness realm and the first question from one of these fucking kids was what kind of car do you drive Oh, you're missing the point. And that's why you'll have a bus pass forever. But it was like, for them, they wanted to be like, they wanted validation that what I was doing worked. And it's sadly, like, you almost have to show the house or the fucking G-Wagon or like whatever. Like, thank God I had a fucking $200,000 car to, you know, (laughs) like, because they would have been like, oh, this guy drives a Civic? Oh, he can go fuck himself. But I mean, God forbid I like, you know, trees and stuff Uh, or, (laughs) you know, stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's just funny that these kids are like, a lot of them expect to start a job with like $200,000 a year salary. You know what I mean? And they don't understand how much work it would take to get to something that makes that. I mean, a lot of people think that they're just going to be millionaires like immediately. They think they're going to be on YouTube and be superstars and all these things. And it's like, whoa, I don't know what's going to happen. Like there's like the baby boomer realm. And I think we're like in the baby retard realm. And we're going to be like the whole world is going to be fucked in five years. Yeah, that's a whole nother. We were having a conversation the other night about like natural selection versus sexual selection. And the fact that like the dude who can't throw a barbell over his head and can't like pick up his groceries, but he can make fat stocks. He's going to do all right. Like he's going to have kids and those kids are not going to be able to do anything. But it's like you want to hope that there's like a resurgence of, I don't know, there's a whole like, oh, man, I have to have a conversation. Who's that guy who wrote that book? about like masculinity and stuff that everyone like was all on board with. You have no, it's, it's laugh. That's another topic, but it's like with the fitness stuff, cause you can fail and that's not something that gets sold to kids. Like you can't fail tests anymore. I remember going back to my, my high school when I was home a few years ago and I, my physics teacher was like, literally called these kids retards in front of them. And it's like, we use the R word a few times. So it's like, cause it's a politically incorrect podcast. I'm doing the fuck I want. But it's like, he literally looked at these kids and like, dude, I can't fucking fail any of these retards anymore. In front of the entire class. It's like, because, like, if I fail them, I have to, have to sit down with their parents. I'm like, why do they fail? Because they didn't try hard enough. It's like, no, now everyone passes. And it's like, now all of a sudden, who should be getting, yeah, dude. They, yeah, that's a thing. Like, in Canada, it's like, you know, political correctness and social justice and all that stuff are, like, paramount. But it's like, you start to see what that looks like. Because people get, like, just like in the business world, you see the people who don't have to run into that adversity of, like, you know, sliding in the DM for 30 bucks an ebook until your thumbs are sore from doing it for 12 hours. Like, imagine not only having to not run into that inconvenience in your business, but never in your life. 
Like, I failed. Shit, shit. I, I almost got kicked out of grad school. I was looking on the barrel of $180,000 of debt. And then they came in with lawyers. We'd like to talk about your, your behavior in school. It's like, oh, fuck. Like, this is real shit. It's like they don't they don't experience that anymore. So some people don't run into their first problem until they're 30 years old. And it's like my dad would like or my mom would come home with like the belt of the spoon and be like. I used to get beat as a kid, bro. That shit was real. You beat your kid now. You're fucked. Yeah. But like, dude, some, <laughs> some of my friends who are doing the best right now are like Eastern Europeans who just like they moved to Canada and everyone's like, you can't beat your kids. It's like, yeah, we don't know. We don't. That's not a word in Serbia. My buddy Igor Jayic, he's 6'4". At his biggest, he was probably like 245. His mom was 90 pounds. When Mama Jayic got on the phone, Igor got the fuck home. He was like, he was like the fucking roadrunner. It's like, oh man, his mom probably called. But it's like, crack the whip, man. I don't know. It's just the, the, the lack of this. When you see it, and you can see it in like just the level of quality in some of the like some of our competitors some of the people who are in the same space it's like there's enough out there to go around that some of the stuff is seeping into popular culture you're like what are you doing but it's like if you just if you only got beat as a child i wouldn't have to deal with this i always play with the notion of like like some, like my friend Sonny webster's here right now is staying with me and he's 25 he's turning 26 in like a week and he already does like very very well and i'm 33 and i'm like you know, we're talking, we talk about business ideas, we go back and forth, and it's I love having him here. It's his second time here already. And I'm like, fuck, like I'm so like internally jealous that you have that you're making all this money now as a twenty five year old. And I'm like, I start thinking about it and I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'd want to change the way that I did it. Like when I was young, people are gonna be like, Dude, you're fucking thirty three, you're fucking young. So it's like when I was like twenty to twenty seven, I mean, fuck, I had a hard time. And like I look back now and like fuck those were the best times. I'm look I'm like, yeah, I did this, I did that. I'm smiling talking about it, you know, but there was there were some really great training moments. Like I love to train and like I would train all day, like every day. Me and my friends, like on Sunday, we used to call it Sunday Mass, which would be like, you know, for someone to go to church, but we would call it Sunday Mass, which was actually short for massacre. And we would just train all day. We were in downtown Los Angeles. It was me. Andrew Ager at the time, Ronnie Tizo when he was normal still. And like we were just on the sidewalk throwing weights and there's photos of us, like black and white photos, like lifting in LA side streets and like there's bums walking by and like we were walking down the street with barbells over our head down the fucking city. It was insane. And there was like a police department right next door. Like we were fucking out of our minds. And I mean, I look back and I'm like, I've never, tr- that's, that's worth all the money in the world to just think about that. And I mean, eventually, like as you start to get more stuff, like more money, like more success and everything, it still doesn't mean dick without cool relationships and something fun to do every day. Like I would trade everything just to make sure that I'm like have something exciting every day to do. Like, I don't think I understand now why like someone, you know, who's worth like a billion dollars just keeps going. I'm like, why do they keep going? I'm like, well, fucking just bored. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like the boredom thing is a real thing. Yeah, it's weird. Like, I mean, you have to be passionate about something. I know Tony Robbins always talks about like, there's no such thing as success. It's fulfillment. And if you're not fulfilled, then like you'll never really find success. Well, that's like, I mean, that's way deep. Like that's, you know, Victor Frankl, man's search for meaning. Like that's the oldest, that's the idea of like re- organized religion. Like that's literally the oldest story ever told. But man. then everybody will, it will, people will listen right now and be like, oh yeah, you talk about fulfillment. I just want that motherfucker's house and his net and everything. And it's like, no, listen, like I'm really telling you that like every single person when they get there and they find the success, they always say the same thing. Like you have to take that as some criticism. Like you have to take that as like real things that you can learn from. Like if everybody says it, like think about the hottest chick you ever wanted to go out with. You're younger now. You're like, let's let's say you're 18. Like, all I want to do is sleep with this girl. You've been jerking off to her for like 45 days straight. With you a hook grip. Find, oh, for sure. With tape on. And then all of a sudden, you finally sleep with her. And you're like, oh, I'm good. That's what it's like to have all the things. The chase is gone. Once the chase is over, it's a little bit different. When you find somebody that you actually want to date and be with for a while. I mean, I've had girlfriends for longer than a year. Been, or the 24-hour passports that I give them when they come to my house. But... You, you chase, you chase, you chase, you get it. And then all of a sudden, like that little bit of a chase, that, that fun factor is gone. So I think that if you're chasing something that you truly love, you never really get to the end of the rainbow anyway. You're still looking for different things. And I think to become a true entrepreneur, you answer all of the questions that perplex you during that process. So like, you know, for me, like the ad agency was I needed an ad agency for my things. And I was like, all right, well, it's doing really well. So why don't I just do that for other people? Because my friends are asking me what to do. So I answered that question. 
when I owned the gym and everybody wanted to know what we were doing in the gym, I gave them the online program. When everybody wanted to ask me what I was doing with my workouts, I gave them high intensity interval bodybuilding stuff. And when people wanted to know how to change their body, I gave them the challenge. Like it's literally everything I did, the podcast, what do you, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? Listen to this. It's literally just answering questions. And that's, that's like the true entrepreneur way is to answer all of the questions. So the more questions you can answer, like the more businesses you'll have, the more revenue streams you'll have, the more you'll be able to fucking be fulfilled because everyone's going to be stoked. So I'm going to end up like bringing this full circle and just being like, okay, when they have questions, where do they find you? So for me, it's Instagram is Ryan Fish, R-Y-A-N-F-I-S-C-H. And my website is actually jimryan.com. So G-Y-M-R-Y-A-N.com. And everyone's like, well, that's interesting. And I was like, well, everything started with a gym. Wow. How good is that? Now you're going to get a bunch of d- more DMs. Now you have less time to do the shit you need to get done. Plus, everything started with Jim Jones. Right. Right? And he spells his with G-Y-M. So I got a lot of really cheeky little little words and different things. You're just so. a living pun is what you are. All right, man. Well, I appreciate the hospitality. I appreciate you having into your uh, humble abode. I'm coming yeah. back when the net's in. And I don't think I'm leaving. Dude, for Pre- sure. Appreciate it. We got to get that thing weight loaded, though. The way this is going. It's oh, like, it's 5,000 pound weight limit. I love that you know that. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks yeah. so much.